Shalom. Welcome to a teaching by Beit Shalom, a One New Man ministry. So today is part two of our series, Light of Messiah in Genesis. And before I launch into today's um, meditation, I would like to quickly recap for you part one, which by the way is on YouTube if you wanted to listen to it. So recap of part one. And the way I phrased part one to get us, to get us going was, there is a mystery of the t- about the two lights that show up in day one and day four of creation. What is the mystery? Because on day one he says, let there be light. And on day four he says, let there be lights. And on day four is when we have the sun, moon, and the stars. So if that is true, Lord God, what was the thing that you created on day one when you said, let there be light? So that was the mystery. So in part one, by looking at the original Hebrew, we realized and we have the understanding that on day one, the thing that was created, the description of the thing that was created on day one uses a different Hebrew word than the thing that was created on day four. So the thing that was created on day one is or. And we all know that term, or is light. But the thing that's created on day four is ma'or. They sound similar, but they're not exactly the same. But in our English translation, it just says, let there be light on day one. And then on day four, it says, let there be lights. How would you know it's two different Hebrew words and they mean different things? They actually mean different things. And if you understand what it means, then there is no longer a mystery, right? It's like, I understand what you did on day one. And that was very different from what you did on day four because you used a different word to describe the thing that you created. Okay, so what does or and maor represent? So first, in the natural, what does or mean? Or means light, pure light. And maor is the thing that holds the light. The luminaries, the bodies that hold the light. And what do these things, or and maor, represent in the spiritual because everything that God creates in the natural signifies or points to something in the spiritual realm. So or represents the light of Messiah. That's what we said in part one. And or we said represents a veiled form of this light. So you can think of pure light and the light that is contained. So it is somehow veiled. You can think of even a a diminishing, not seeing the light in its full brilliance. That's the ma'or, because it is contained in something else. But there's more to this. Yes, all represents the light of Messiah, but there is some nuance to this, which has to do with, and I'm going to use two kind of technical terms, Um, you have to understand the pre-incarnate, and post-incarnate Messiah. So what is incarnation? Incarnation is when he, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He took on a body like you and I have bodies. That is the incarnation. So there is a a representation of the Messiah before the incarnation, that's the pre-incarnate Christ or pre-incarnate Messiah. And then after the incarnation, It is the post-incarnate Messiah. So I'm going to use that term, but hopefully you understand the definition. And you have to understand the pre- and post-incarnate Messiah to really get into the the details of Or and Maor. And we'll do that today. And the second thing, uh, which we said last week, was again that Maor represents a veiled form of this light. But again, we didn't get into the details of what this means. What does a whale form of the light really mean? So our goal for today is the following. We'll get a bit more specific on what or represents by understanding the pre- and post-incarnate Messiah. And the second is we'll unpack the details of what ma'or, when we say ma'or represents a veil form of the light, what does that mean? So we'll get into both of those things. So that's our goal for today. So... Let's, let's start now um, by just uh, starting with day one creation, which was or. Again, it represents the Messiah or the light of the good news of the glory of Messiah. So either way, right, Messiah or the good news of the Messiah. 
And so what I'm going to say today, which I did not say last week, is Or is actually the pre-incarnate Messiah. So I've already defined what pre-incarnate Messiah is, but let us look at a few passages which will help us develop this idea of what what does a pre-incarnate Christ look like? So we'll, we'll, we'll begin with Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So already that's introducing the idea that Messiah in his incarnation is going to let go of something, right? He's not going to hold on to it. He's going to let go of something. Verse 7 says, But emptied himself by taking the form of a, of a servant being born in the likeness of men. So the very fact of Messiah being born in the likeness of humanity, you and I, in the form of a servant, there is an, an emptying of himself. There is a letting go of that which he had. Now we can't fully unpack all of this because there's a lot of, um, because God is God <laughs> and the incarnation itself is a mystery. We don't know everything about it, but we can look at what God has said in his word and understand a few things. So I don't, um, I'm not, Proposing that we fully understand, because God is God, we can't fully understand, but to the extent that he's saying something in his word, to that extent we can understand a few things. So there's a letting go of something when Messiah, when the pre-incarnate Messiah took the form of a man. Yes, that we understand from Philippians 2.5. So the one who was in the form of God, in the fullest sense he was in the form of God, but had not as, as of yet emptied himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. The pre-incarnate Messiah is the second person of the Godhead who, ha- who hasn't taken on flesh yet. That's the pre-incarnate Messiah. Uh, you'll remember from John 1.14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That happened at a specific time, right? Which means before that time, he did not take on flesh. That is the pre-incarnate Messiah. In the pre-incarnate Messiah, there is no limitation imposed on him because he hasn't taken up a body yet. As soon as he took a body, guess what? He was localized in a specific place and a specific time. When he is in the house of Joseph and Mary, he's not somewhere else. You can see now, you can can kind of see the, the limitation or the veiled aspect of the pure or the pure light uh, when he is taking on a body. So the post-incarnate Messiah would be the opposite of all of this. He is the second person of the Godhead who has taken on some limitations as he confines himself to a body. Again, recall in Philippians 2, 6, it says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself so there was an emptying there's something that he let go of by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men the post incarnate messiah took on a body in the likeness of men which can feel hunger pain and even succumb to death only a post incarnate messiah could be put to death. How can God be put to death? In fact, there, there are m- many who say, uh, challenge th- our notion of God by saying, your God died? God doesn't die. Beca- they say this, be- and it makes sense, unless you understand that in the incarnation, God is taking on a form that can be put to death. Otherwise, they're right. God cannot be put to death. A post-incarnate Messiah is fully reliant on the Holy Spirit to do the works of God. Think about this. It's like, uh, you know, su- if you watch the Superman series and, you know, he's got these superpowers. Imagine if he had his hands tied behind his back and then he's asked to do these things that the ordinary mortals of earth are asked to do, right? Um, so it's, it's like God 
the second person of the Godhead is like, uh, I'm not going to use all of my superpowers. I'm going to rely on the same power that you, the ones that have come to redeem, have access to. And what is that? The Spirit of God. So Messiah in the post-incarnate form is now being subservient to the point of being fully reliant on the Holy Spirit to do the works of God. Where do we get this theology from? Well, we can start with Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11, which all of you are quite familiar with. Isaiah 11, verse 1, beginning verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of God shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So Isaiah was intimating, communicating to us, even before the incarnation, that there is co going to come one from, the, uh, from God who is going to have the Spirit of God rest upon him. And I is that not what literally happened when he was baptized in the Jordan? John was hesitating. Lord, sh shouldn't you be baptizing me? No, let it be so, because he was also fulfilling what Isaiah said. And so in Matthew 3, Verse 16, it says, When Yeshua was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Fulfillment of what we just read in Isaiah 11. And then a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So that is a picture of the post-incarnate Messiah. Now I'm going to switch to Maor, which was created on day four. And I'm going to say that Maor on day four actually points to the post-incarnate Messiah. If all represented the pre-incarnate Messiah, who was not limited in any fashion, pure light, not limited, Maor is now that light in a veiled form. It perfectly captures the idea of the incarnation of Christ. So let's look at a few more passages that will add to our understanding of what happened during the incarnation. So Colossians 1.15 He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Colossians 2.9 For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Messiah in the incarnation is the fullness of deity localized in the human shell. But nevertheless, a perfect representation of the Father in bodily form. You know, in our attempt to understand all of this, we, we got to stop where Scripture stops. Go as far as what Scripture tells us, because God is communicating something to us. He is revealing some of the mystery, but He can't fully unveil all of it because we won't be able to grasp it right now. So go as far as the Scripture says and no more. So I'm going to stop there by saying, even in the in, even though the incarnation is the, the deity being localized in a human shell, nevertheless, we're going to claim, just like Colossians 2.9 says, it is a perfect representation of the Father in bodily form. Messiah taking on a bodily form was important. And we talked about this briefly last week. Why, why, why did Messiah have to do that? Why did Messiah have to take on a bodily form? There are many reasons. One of which was, you and I cannot behold perfect deity and still live. As God told Moses in Exodus 33:20, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. That is one of the reasons Messiah had to come in a veiled form, because we cannot behold the one who dwells in unapproachable light. I mean, think of the qualification there, right? It says unapproachable. It is already communicating to us that this light is one that you cannot approach. 
So Lord, how do we see you? You are light, how do we see you? Okay, I'm going to take on a veiled form. I'm going to limit what you're going to see. And that's what he did. And this one we can behold, and that is God in the face of Christ. We are able to see him. Because he's able to kind of diminish the things that would cause us to vaporize. He's able to diminish it to a point that we can now behold him. We can now eat with him. We can fellowship with him. And that's what the disciples did 2,000 years ago. He walked with them. He wept with them. He ate with them. This picture of the incarnate Son of God, or Ben Elohim, Son of God, is analogous to the ore contained in a reduced or veiled form and is therefore perfectly captured in the picture of the Maor, the luminary or the body that holds the ore. This is the reason, so again, what did we just establish? We established that the post-incarnate Messiah, or the Messiah in the incarnation, is what the Maor represents. And on day four is what, when Maor was created, and day four talks about the sun, moon, and the stars. This is the reason why Messiah in the scriptures can even be referred to by things that are created. Did God not say you, you cannot have any earthen images, icons to describe me? Did God not say, say that? And yet, Messiah is often described in earthly terms, in terms of created things, right? How can this be? Did God just contradict himself? No, this is because Messiah is a veiled form that can be described with things that are created. So that is the reason we can see that the Son of God is described using created things like the sun, and the stars, and we have we have scripture passages that specifically make this reference. So Malachi three twenty or Malachi four two, if you're looking at your standard uh, Christian Bibles, it says, "For you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings." Not S O N S U N, the created Son, which was created on day four. But who is this speaking of? Son of Righteousness. The created Son doesn't have any. Righteousness, right? The S-U-N. It is the other son, Ben Elohim. Yeah. So here you see the juxtaposition of the created thing, the sun, which was created on day four, being used to describe a function, an attribute of Messiah. So that's why you can see Christ described using these created things like the Maor, which is the sun is a Maor, a body that holds the light. And here's another reference in 2 Peter 1, 17. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. What, what is this holy mountain reference? It is a reference to the Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew 17, when Moses and Elijah appeared on the mount, and he was transfigured before them, and um, and his face shone like what? The sun. Ooh, interesting, right? Again, the Maor on day four. And his clothes became as white as the light. So that's what's being referenced to in the middle of 2 Peter 1. 17 and 18. So coming back to 2 Peter 1, verse 19, it says, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Wow, Messiah is now referred to as the star. We saw that he was referred to as the sun. And his face was like the shine, shining like the sun in the during the transfiguration. And now, at the end of Second Peter one verse nineteen, morning star, 
All of these things, the sun and the stars, were the things that were created on day four, the Maor. And there's one more reference in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. These references could not be made unless during day four of creation, what God created in the natural, the maor, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, which would hold the light, were in the spiritual realm pointing to Messiah. There's nothing in all of creation that does not point to some work of God. This is actually a true statement. You might think, how, how is that? That's a, isn't, it's not going too far? No. No. Everything that is created in nature in its purest form, when God has sanctified it, represents him. Because he is in everything. Everything is held together in him. So it's not a surprising or a crazy thought to make a crazy claim. As long as it is sanctified for his purposes. Which, by the way, is you and me. You and I are sanctified, set apart for his purposes. So you and I also carry him represent him and we'll get more into that as our next thought so to just to wrap up this portion of the meditation or is a picture of the pre-incarnate messiah maor is a type of the post-incarnate or the incarnate messiah okay so those are the if you want to put two bullet points that's the summary of everything that we've said up to this point okay but there is more to what Maor represents. Maor represents the incarnate Messiah, but Maor represents something else. What is that? So we're going to look at a few passages before we figure out or come to a conclusion on what else does Maor represent in addition to representing the incarnation or the post-incarnate Messiah. So Matthew 5, verse 14. Here's what Messiah says. You are the light of the world. Wait a minute. Aren't you the light of the world, Yeshua, Jesus? Aren't you the light? That light, who in a veiled form became the Christ, is now telling us who follow him, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand so it gives light to all in the house. You and I are called to be a light in the world such so that you will give light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that's Matthew 5, 14 to 16. So the Veiled light, which is the incarnate Messiah, is now telling the rest of us who are following him, you are also light to the world. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, which is a reference to the creation narrative, right? Let light shine out of darkness. That is going back to the creation account. It says, for God who said, let light shine out of out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts. So you can already see the light now coming into our hearts. It's shining in our hearts. It's almost like the orb, which is a pure light, is now being birthed, being placed inside of us, inside your heart and my heart. For what purpose? Let's keep reading. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Messiah. So now we can see the light is placed in the hearts of his followers so that we would give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God as represented in the face of Messiah. We reflect the light of the Messiah. So think about this. Messiah is light. And now we are reflecting his light because the Father placed... When, we, when you and I were born again, the light of Messiah was placed... In our hearts okay so do, do you and I have original light 
Native intrinsic light? No. A foreign light, the light of Messiah, was placed in our hearts. So if I were to now um, ask you, which of the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and the stars, which of them do not have natural light but reflect the light? It's the moon. The sun and stars, they have native light. We talked about the, the, the physics of the process by which the sun generates light last week. But the moon reflects the light that comes from the sun, S-U-N, right? So when you and I are reflecting the light of Messiah, you do not have a native light. You can only be the light of the world if you are reflecting his light. Just like the moon does not have native intrinsic light, but can only give light when it is facing the S-U-N. So it is with us that only when we are in communion with the light of the world, which is Messiah, can we to become the light of the world. So if I take you back to day four, creation account, it talks about the two great lights. One to rule the day and the other to rule the night. What is the great, what, what is the light that rules the day? The sun. What is the light that rules the night? The moon. And the same passage in, in Genesis then says, the greater of these lights, so first it says there are two, two great lights, one to rule the day, one to rule the night, and then it says, then it's distinguishing these two lights and says, oh, one of them is greater than the other. The greater light is to rule the day, and the lesser, lesser light is to rule the night. Um, and we are like that lesser light, because we have no native light. We are like that lesser light, like the moon, who is reflecting the light off of the sun, and now bringing light to dark places. So we are the lesser light, according, you know, if I use a Genesis uh, 1, chapter 1 reference, we are the lesser light. Messiah is the greater light. He is like the S-U-N, we are like the, the moon, the lesser light. But the moon does rule the night, doesn't it? Right? God did say the lesser light to rule the nighttime. Actually, that Genesis 1 account now gives us a sense of our mission all the way back in the first chapter. We are called to reflect the light of Messiah and bring light into the darkness. Our mission, you don't, you don't have to wait till Matthew chapter 28 to find out what your mission and purpose is. Your mission was made clear even in the natural created things on day one. We who, ha we who have the light of Messiah shine in our hearts are called and designed to reflect his light in a dark world, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun during the night. So, in closing, I'm just going to summarize. Or, the Hebrew word or, not the English word or, the Hebrew word or represents the pre-incarnate Messiah. Again, or is a thing that was created on day one when God said, let there be light. That represe represents the pre-incarnate Messiah. And the, on day four, we know that Maor was created, or the bodies that hold the light. And the greater light within this Maor represents the post-incarnate Messiah. And the lesser light of the Maor, which was created on day four, is us. Thus, you see right there in the creation account, Messiah and his bride. Messiah and his bride, who is called to reflect his glory. Messiah and his bride, who is called to reflect his glory. And uh, let's just come before, before the Father and um, ask him to bring this home to us, this revelation, this understanding. So Father, give us a deeper comprehension in a very
palpable way of the reality of us being the bearers of the light of Messiah who is in us. Show us the weight and honor of carrying this precious light and testimony because you have placed this light of Messiah in our hearts. When you declared on the day that we were born again, let there be light in my heart and your heart. It's like God was saying all over again, let there be light the day that you and I came to Messiah. And that was the light of Messiah. Father, show us the responsibility that comes with carrying this most holy and special light. That we would not treat it lightly, but do everything that you have called us to. To bring forth this light into the places of darkness that you have sent us to. By your Spirit who enables us. In Yeshua's name. Amen. I receive the blessing. Yivarecha Adonai Vayishmarecha. Yair Adonai Panavilecha Vichunecha. Isa Adonai Panavilecha Vesem Lacha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you to grant you his shalom through the Sar Shalom, the sure Messiah. Amen. Be amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. For more content like this, like, follow, and subscribe. Thank you.